OT. I am Elise Jesse, and I'm thrilled to be here with you. Um, I started covering the Cincinnati Bengals in November of 2013 for a local news station here in Cincinnati. And um, I have been working with James Rapine and all Bengals since October of 2020. Um, and I've been doing some writing for them. And now, as you can see, this role has expanded. And I'm so grateful that you guys are on this journey with me. And to be honest with you, I would love to stop talking about myself. <laughs> Let's talk about your favorite NFL team, the Cincinnati Bengals. They are one of the hottest teams to talk about right now, especially after the excitement that we watched in 2021. Their defense seems versatile. They seem like they're clicking really well. Even though Jesse Bates is not there, they still seem like they are gelling perfectly right now. And one of the biggest keys of their defense is linebacker Logan Wilson. I had a conversation with him this afternoon in the locker room and um, we were just talking about, you know, his journey back to getting into the swing of things. He had uh, surgery on his right so uh, shoulder with a torn labrum. And um, he said that since he's had that surgery, he feels better than ever. And that's a great sign. We love to hear that. But um, take a listen to this conversation. Yeah, it feels good. I mean, obviously, the, the best thing for me is just to get those repetitions to feel my shoulder out, you know, make sure, you know, understanding that it's, everything's going to be OK. It's always that mental aspect of coming back from a, uh, a surgery like that, you know, and just got to get back into the mix and um, understand that my shoulder is fine and it actually feels better than it did last year when I was playing with it. So. Wow. Oh, okay. So that's, that's really good news yeah. for you. Does that make you feel more confident going into 2022? Yeah. I mean, it's like back to square one, um, in terms of like how I started last year with my shoulder being fully healthy. And, um, it's good to have it fixed and not have to worry about as much of the pain playing through it. You good? <laughs> have you had to do, um, extra, you know, recovery after 11 on 11s, like getting back into the swing of things, were you more sore the next day? No, or was not it okay? as, yeah, not as, I think the, the training staff and coach staff has done a really good job of not just kind of throwing me in the fire, so to say, like just kind of building it up. And I feel like that's been really good because I haven't really been any more sore than I would be typically, you know, practicing football. So, um, you know, very thankful they handle it the way they can. You guys are kind of in the dog days of training camp right yeah. now. How much are you guys looking forward to just starting the regular season and playing games that matter. Yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll obviously be great to get to that point. Um, but I think, you know, I'm a big person. I kind of just live in the moment, like just deal with what I got to deal with right now. And um, I'm just trying to be present, you know, be like our coach always says, like be where your feet are. You know, you can't worry about game day for the Steelers right now. You know, it's kind of living right where we are right now, trying to get better in practice. And um, that's just kind of been my mindset throughout my whole athletic career. Did you play wide receiver at one point? In high school, yeah. In high school? In and high I school, also... I was a wide receiver. I was a corner um, <laughs> kicker and a punter. Okay, so kicking was natural for you. Yes. I saw a video of you doing that a couple yeah, times Yeah, I grew ago. up playing soccer, so... Okay, so high you're kind of like a Swiss Army knife of sorts. Yeah, some could say that. Whatever, <laughs> whatever everyone wants to say. It seems like in today's NFL, when you can do multiple things and add value in multiple different spots other yeah. than your own position, that secures you even further. Yeah, I mean, it definitely helps. I mean, the more you can do, the better you off you are um, to be able to help the team. And I. I think I credit that to just not, you know, not playing just one sport, but just developing myself as a better overall athlete throughout my whole athletic career when I was little, um, being a multi-sport athlete. So many kids nowadays want to just focus solely on one sport, and I think that there's, like, yeah, you can get better at that one sport, but there's things that basketball will help you with with football and track will help you with with football, and they all kind of coincide together, and um, kids kind of get lost in that these days. But I think I credit a lot of my development as an athlete to playing multiple sports. You seem um, pretty grounded and very kind, but do you ever trash talk Evan McPherson? You're no. one of maybe the only people who can kick field goal. What, 40 yards? I made a 50 yard. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever use that and trash no. talk with him? No. Evan's my guy. He's the, He's got his job <laughs> locked up, I think. I'm not worried about taking his job. I don't need to either. Kicking is different. I mean, the mental aspect of kicking is people think that kicking is easy because you just got to swing and kick the ball, but it's, it's way harder than people think. So would you be comfortable, if needed, to go in and kick a field goal? Yeah, as much as I get more repetition with it because I haven't really kicked since high school, <laughs> um, but I have been starting to practice a little more just in case that was to come. Knock on wood, we don't want that to ever have to come. Right. Um, but, you know, if, if necessary, I'll be ready. What are you personally working on 
in training camp this year? Outside of obviously healing yeah, and getting your shoulder obvious. back in the swing of things, yeah. but outside of that, what else are you working on? Um, that's definitely the biggest thing is just getting healthy. Um, but I think that just being more consistent with my footwork, there was times where my pad level got too high. Okay. Um, last year, I just want to keep my pad level down. Um, and then just be more ball aware is one thing I want. I want to force more fumbles, get more fumble recoveries. Um, truthfully, just get the ball back to our offense as much as we can because um, you know, I think our offense is pretty, pretty dangerous. So the more we can get the ball back to them, the more often we're going to score points. Logan Wilson was certainly being modest there. I watched him at the beginning of practice during special teams drills, and he was drilling the ball from field goal range. He seemed very comfortable with that. And that has got to give the Bengals confidence. It's got to give Logan Wilson some confidence going in, knowing that if there is a situation where Evan McPherson is injured and Logan has to come in and kick that field goal that he can do so successfully. Um, you know, it's a long season, 17 games, and then you're talking about the postseason. So it's always great for them to have that insurance plan. Um, so special teams looking good. Defense, of course, looking good with Logan Wilson at linebacker there. And we've got to talk about this explosive offense. It's going to be another fantastic, exciting show in 2022 with Joe Burrow healthy, Joe Mixon, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, Tyler Boyd. They've revamped the offensive line. It is going to be one of the best shows on your television this season. And with Joe Burrow having the surgery on his ruptured appendix, um, he's he's slowly ramping into things. Uh, he started back at practice on Sunday, um, back in the full swing of things it looked like this afternoon. So that's a great sign. He's got 24 days to prepare for that season opener. And I talked with first round pick, former first round pick in 1986 out of Tennessee. You all know him. You you probably remember this draft, Tim McGee. And I love getting his perspective on things because sometimes former NFL players, oftentimes really, they notice things about current players that maybe you and I wouldn't pick up on. Um, and I really like that he does not beat around the bush. He brings a ton of honesty. And I think that you guys are really going to like that. So take a listen. Well, when you say be ready, you know, we all know the proverbial answer will be, yes, he's ready to play. He's ready to go. And Zach Taylor is going to, at his press conference, talk about how well he's going to perform and how healthy he is when, in all actuality, only one person knows. And that person in Joe Burrow still doesn't know. His body will tell him that. And especially when he takes hits, when he takes hits from the blind side and he takes hit in the, uh, the midsection, the question is, is how will his body react? That's this is not a mind over matter injury. This is a body function of an organ that has been removed that is, as you call it, burst. So I don't think no one's going to know how healthy he would be. Now, again, he could be 100 percent. But for all the people that give an opinion, including him, uh, I wouldn't put a lot of validity into that. So you're saying that no one knows at all until after week one, and then we'll know more. Oh, if he's ready for the season. He's not going to know during warmups. He's not going to know until he goes back to throw and someone uh, tackles him in an awkward position. That's when he's going to know how he will perform. Now, again, he can prepare. I am not saying he won't prepare like the old Joe Burrow. I am not saying he won't have his tight spiral. He won't be the what appears to be the legendary Joe Burrow of Cincinnati. I, I'm not saying that. What I'm simply saying, as far as the injury is concerned, the injury itself, no doctor, no one but God, of course, that really will know and have the measurable on how he would react. Because he can go one quarter, be fine, then get hit. He can go two quarters and be fine. And let's just face it, at least, no one's going to tell us after the game that, oh, he got hit in the first quarter and it affected him. That's just not... The, 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 the words that come out, the truth doesn't necessarily come out in this day and age in, in, in professional football. They're going to say, oh, yeah, he was fine. It didn't matter, blah, blah, blah. You know, they got to toughen out. You're going to get all these cliche things. Yes, because they don't want anyone to actually know what is going on with him and whether or not his injury is serious after a hit like that, after a surgery like that, or if he will be okay. They don't, number one, they don't know. They do yeah. not know. Like I said, the only person that will have the best idea will be Joe, but his body is, is going to talk to him and it's not going to give him words. And that's just one of those injuries that, 
you know, it, it's not an ankle, it's not a knee, and you pregame, you say, oh, it feels fine. Well, again, until you really get out there, uh, until he gets out there, he's he's just not going to know. And any whatever they're spewing out of that uh, that locker room, I, I just I take it as a grain of salt. So not saying that they're you know purposely trying to misreport something. It's just they they don't know. Well, and I mean, you're I really value your opinion because you were a player in the NFL um, and you don't beat around the bush and you're just the pure honesty is something that I really adore about you, Tim. Um, And I just wanted to know what your thoughts were on um, building that connection between wide receiver and quarterback. Is that something that has to happen every single year before the season or um, is that something that needs to be worked on and does that need? to evolve um, in training camp every single year? Or does it just continue streamlined for both? You know, it's, oh my God, at least it, it's, it's fascinating to hear people talk when they say chemistry and being on the same page, you know, those things do happen, but there are, there are intangibles. There's, right. You don't go out, you know, I, I hear that, oh, we, we posed a question on the radio show the other day. Well, who would you prefer, T. Higgins or Jamar Chase? And, and, and some of the people said, well, you know, Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase, they have that chemistry from LSU. It's like, what, what, what are we talking about here? It's like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not something that you can just spew and say because they knew each other two years ago or they played with each other three years ago. You know, I, personally, I think if there's one overrated element of football is the word chemistry. I just think it's overblown. You, you go to camp because T Higgins didn't play with him in college and, right. you know, he had a wonderful year and the receivers that come after T Higgins or, or Jamar Chase are going to have great so it's not that necessary. I, I just think it's overblown to a degree where go work hard in training camp, be on the same page, develop that sense of security and trust in one another, let it go. And, and again, you're talking about some dynamic receivers so, and a right. dynamic quarterback. So that in itself will lead to a lot of positive things if they're healthy. Well, and speaking of dynamic receivers, I mean, you've got Tyler Boyd, T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, and you've also got Joe Mixon coming out of the backfield. But still, in the national spotlight, when the national media, when they talk about the Cincinnati Bengals and they're asked and they have the discussions about the AFC North, we continue to hear people say um, that the Bengals will not be the best offense in the AFC. Um, I personally disagree with that. And maybe you have a different opinion. What is your opinion? Because the Baltimore Ravens will not be the same Baltimore Ravens that they were last year because they will get their health back this season. Well, I, I think when you look first, you got to look back at the Bengals season and all the success and rightfully so they earned it. They earned it right across the board. However, there were some things that happened that was beyond their control that did not affect them. They didn't get affected by COVID. They didn't get affected, yeah. affected like the Baltimore Ravens with just injury after injury after injury at key positions at key times, very pivotal times during the season. They didn't have to. The ball bounced their way. The ball hit the goalpost, went inside. Un- unlike the last 30 years, everything went right. <laughs> so that's why I would necessarily disagree from a local standpoint and a Bengal fan, but I can understand and somewhat agree with their perspective is everything is not going to go well. Someone of the big four or five we have between Joe Burrow, Joe, Joe Mixon, T. Higgins, and Jamar Chase, and Tyler Boyd, there's going to be more likely an injury. I'm not saying it will be a devastating injury, but one injury to Joe Burrow, we're not, we're not having this conversation on how dynamic they are. It's just plain and simple. So, I, again, I can understand it. But I, I would think on paper, if we're talking on paper, I, I, you got to have lost your mind not to say they're not the most talented team on paper. I, I mean, well, I would say offense and skill position. Uh, somebody needs their temperature checked if they're picking, say, Buffalo or Kansas City. <laughs> Many are picking but, Buffalo. They're, they're going Josh Allen. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I just think it's one of those that, you know, What's surprising and more disappointing, typically when that happens, it happens because there's a big metropolitan city out there like L.A. or Miami. So and the people, there's just more people. But come on, Buffalo. I mean, come on. 
Buffalo, really? <laughs> you know, how do you pick the Bills over the Bengals when the Bengals had it? Now, don't get me wrong. The Buffalo, if the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals played in the AFC Championship game, I would sit here and tell you, I really couldn't tell you who would win the game. They are, if they're healthy, I probably would give it to Buffalo because of their defense, but not their offense. I think the Bengals have the most talented offense in the NFL, and I think they're probably the most talented offense on paper, that is, that's been around in quite some time. They are the greatest show on turf. They, they just really are. It's going to be fun to watch them play. I think Bengals fans are lucky and they are deserving of watching an offense like this with Joe Burrow after the last 30 years of football that we've watched. Um, I, I wonder, though, because – Joe Burrow and especially Jamar Chase surprised a lot of people last season before the season. I don't know if you remember or not, but Jamar Chase was being criticized heavily in training camps saying that, you know, Jamar Chase can't catch a ball. Um, he's going to be a bust, all of this stuff. And then he ends up eclipsing 1400 receiving yards, having 13 touchdowns, Joe Burrow th throwing 34 touchdowns um, and amassing over 4,600 yards, I believe. Um, um, will it be more difficult for them to execute this season now that the, the other 31 teams um, have enough tape on this team and know what they can do, what their skill set is? Yeah, I, I, I never forget during my career back when the dinosaurs was roaming the earth. I can just <laughs> remember, I can just remember, you know, Bruce Cosley, the, uh, the uh, Bengals offense coordinator, he got, you know, they, they know what we're going to do but that don't mean they can stop us. So yeah, you know, you, you will find on tape, you will find some of the Bengals tendencies, but if Zach Taylor was in the lab, which I'm pretty sure he was and the out offensive staff, they, they know what their tendencies were too. So now they'll make their adjustments, but when it comes to who are you going to cover, you have to pick your poison. If you're, and the one thing I love about their receiving core, all of them have different qualities. You know, Jamar Chase is built – I mean, he's great run after the catch, very acrobatic, and we know how, how dynamic he is. But then you got T. Higgins, who's tall, lanky, has a wingspan of a seven-foot basketball player, explosive as well. Tyler Boyd just works the middle of the field like no other in the NFL. And, you know, Joe Mixon is a train running downhill. So it's – pick your poison. It is not something – I think it will be a situation where – the only two things that can really stop them, well, three, number one, injuries. Number two, themselves, getting ahead of themselves. Their head blows up a little bit and things don't work. And third is Zach Taylor. If Zach Taylor, if Zach Taylor will continue to manage the game and manage himself as well as Joe Burrow, I think they'll be phenomenal. But the one thing we know that we've seen them before get a little, okay, instead of running Joe Mixon on fourth and inches, well, you know, let's try this play that, you know, I, I was dreaming about it last night in my sleep. Uh, let's try that one. And it doesn't work. So if, if you just get down to the basic and use your talent as, 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 as just don't do anything special is what I'm trying, what I'm trying to say. I think there'll be, I think they'll have another great year. Do you think that, you know, if Joe Burrow doesn't like a certain play that's called, that maybe he'll pull the card of audibling a little bit more than he did last season? I know I he did a little bit last season, but maybe he'll turn that up a notch. I think he has that right to do it. But again, when you get into that area, at least, you're, now you're talking about egos. When it works, hey, man, he called that play. He, it, it was great. When it doesn't work, why in the hell did you do that? What did you see? So you got to have that trust. And I know they, they're, from what I understand, I've never been around them before, but from what I understand, the two of them have a, as they call it, a chemistry off the football field and they have a friendship and they, they built their trust. And let's just face it. I think Joe Burrow has earned that right. If he doesn't see something and I've, I've been on the line of scrimmage before many, many a time, and, yeah, if you don't see something, why run a play just because? Why do something just because? If a defense gives you something that you wasn't expecting, he should have the latitude and fortitude to go change it to help the offense and put him in a better position to uh, succeed. 
Well, I know that I've talked to Tyler Boyd and T Higgins and um, both of them have said that they want to eclipse a thousand yards receiving this season. You have done that before in your career. Will it, they make it sound easy when we watch the NFL, it seems like an easy feat to us, but what does that entail from a player's perspective? Well, for them, how they plan 17 games in the past happened, you know, I mean, they can get a, <laughs> a little bit easier for them, I guess. There, but now again, not comparing eras because I, 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 I still think they would all three would be very successful in any era. Yeah. Uh, it's going to come down to this, and I, I said this on the radio show uh, going into last year. There's only one football. There's one football every play. They, they don't make five footballs. This is not drill work where everybody gets to catch the ball on the same play. It doesn't happen that way. That one football will test their emotions and their psychology of when I don't get the ball. If I don't get the ball in the first half and I am T Higgins or Jamar Chase, do I, and I've done it before, I am totally guilty. I'll raise my right hand. I don't know which, which hand is my right nowadays, but <laughs> you pout. You don't, yeah. feel, you don't feel as a competitor, you don't feel that you're contributing. It's not just being selfish. And, you know, again, I go back to that, you know, they always say there's no I in team. And I always say, well, if I don't do good, team don't win. So there is an I in team. <laughs> that's not how you spell it, but I get my point. So yes. if they can stay in the game when they're not getting the ball, when Joe Mixon is running the ball very effectively and he's having a 150-yard day and the balls are not – and Joe Burrow's not throwing the ball 52 times because the defense decided to take away the air game – Will they stay in? Will they start pouting? Will they stay within the system? And I'll, I'll tell you this, I, I give of all the credit that I'll ever give Zach Taylor. I think that has been his biggest asset to keep all those guys ingrained into the game, focused on the game when it's not your turn. I, I mean, I agree with you on that because when you are Zach Taylor and you've won two games one season, four games another season, and then you come back in and you are asking this locker room of professional men to su support what you're saying, trust what you're saying, and follow your lead. Um, and they do, and obviously they did because they were able to make it all the way to the Super Bowl. Um, I think that does say a lot about him and it seems like he's had, you know, a lot of growth since he first took this job in February of 2019. Yeah. And I was one of his biggest critics and I'll be the first to say that. And I was the biggest supporter, but at the same time, I was the biggest critic because again, his ego was clashing with the team. And obviously there was some things going on in the locker room and he was able to yeah. iron those things out and get these guys to continue to play. Now, with that being said, you know, it does help when you pick number one, you know, every single year. Yes. Like, that's what the NFL is built on, that parody where, you know, things will come back to you. And that's what has happened. So you can't just – I won't just give him – I will give him his credit. I will give Coach Lou his credit. But the scouting staff and picking Jamar Chase over who I thought – what I thought would be an offensive lineman. Yeah, you know, me too. Their job, Mike Brown, Katie Job, I mean, Katie Blackburn, they're, Elizabeth Blackburn, they're doing their job. So I think it's a collective effort that has turned this organization around. But, you know, yeah, the cards are stacked against them and making it back to the Super Bowl. But how do we manage our expectations? If they don't go to the Super Bowl, was it a disappointing year? Uh, if, you know, if they get beat by Buffalo or they get upset by Cleveland, you know, how will they be judged? They got a lot of pressure on them now. Well, and you bring up going back to the Super Bowl. I mean, the cards are stacked against them. If we look at the history of the NFL, um, you know, the last six teams to lose in the Super Bowl had a down year offensively the following season. Um, the only team to lose in the Super Bowl and then to get back to the Super Bowl was the Patriots in 2018. Um, Super Bowl 52 was when they lost and then bounced back the next year. Um, so the rule is that a team likely will not make it back to the big game, to the world championship. But are the Bengals the kind of team that could maybe be the exception to the rule? I don't think so. And that's not okay. being pessimistic on them. I, I'm just saying I have to take into account one thing. I know how talented they are. I know they, they, ha they have solid coaching all the way to good coach. But the problem is they had every single thing go their way. 
teams were mesmerized. You know, you, you, you look <laughs> at the Kansas City Chiefs, they were just like, okay, wait a minute. This doesn't happen to the to the Bengals. They the the ball doesn't bounce their way. It's always the opposite way. Everything came together. And I truly mean everything, every single element of the game to be successful and to make it to the Super Bowl. But get this, here's the irony of their entire season. The one play that they needed to win the Super Bowl did not go their way. No. So when you look at that, you 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 have to say every team needs breaks. And mm -hmm. I just think, you know, again, from a talent standpoint, they're on their way to the Super Bowl. But from an injury standpoint, they're always going to be that one injury, and that one injury can change. And I'll, I'll tell you who I think is the most important player outside of Joe Burrow on the Bengals team, and that would be Joe Mixon. He is the mm -hmm. one guy they cannot afford to lose because he's the only running back that can do what he does effectively and put that type of pressure on defense on every down. I think they can lose a receiver and still mm -hmm. be good. They could, they, of course, they could, they could lose a lineman now and still be good, but they cannot lose Joe Mixon. I think you bring up a really good point because, you know, if you, if Joe Mixon were to go down, how are you supposed, how is Zach Taylor, Brian Callahan, how are they supposed to keep a defense honest when suddenly you, you lose the biggest part of your run game? As Baltimore, Baltimore <laughs> lost one, two, three. You need a count. They lost everybody, it seemed like, last year. Key players, they lost. And that's the difference, because remember, yeah. going into the 2022, uh, 2021 season, the Baltimore Ravens were picked to finish up at the top of mm -hmm. one of the best teams. However, it wasn't even, I won't even say it was games. It was practice. These guys got hurt and walked through. They got hurt getting on the plane. They got hurt at home in the kitchen. They, these guys just had the dark cloud left over Cincinnati and Paul Brown, now Paycourt Stadium, and went to Baltimore. We just hope it stays the hell out, out east somewhere. As long as we stay away from that, I think we'll be okay. Well, how do you think that the that the Baltimore Ravens are going to fare this season now that, you know, Lamar Jackson is expected to be full go and healthy? Um, their secondary was decimated last year, their backfield. Um, how do you think that they will compete with the Cincinnati Bengals in division play this season? The Baltimore Ravens scare me. As yeah, a same. Bengals. Me too. Because number one, they're hungry as hell. And when right. the Bengals beat them the first time, they thought this is, you know, this is a one-off. And then when they beat them again, it really pissed them off. I mean, I remember uh, seeing the one guy, uh, I can't think of his name. I can only think of his hairline on. Um, no, um, I don't. <laughs> Bart, was it Bart Scott? Or something yes, like Bart Scott. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. He was mad. I've, ne I've never yeah. seen. <laughs> and and I think he yet. was just portraying really the feelings that, with, that was within that organization. They were kind of like, ugh. We know we can beat them if we just only had 53 players opposed to 21. <laughs> they didn't have the player. They didn't have, and you know, but again, they still tried to compete, so on and so forth. So that's the team that really scares me in the AFC North because if they stay healthy and, you know, personally, I think they have the most dynamic player in the National Football League in Lamar Jackson. Yeah. Man, I, I just think it will be, if I'm an offensive guy, I love to see points scored. Of course, the rules make it that way now. Imagine the Bengals with their, you know, five-headed monster and the um, and Baltimore and Lamar Jackson coming in healthy with a full line and, you know, a running back that, you know, not on crutches using a handicap sticker when he's parked. It, I think it would be just – I think it's going to be one heck of a matchup to watch them play because there's some revenge factors in there. There certainly are. And I, I can't I can't let you go without discussing Jesse Bates. Um mm -hmm. You know, his contract is – he's on his last year of his contract, and they have not gotten a deal done, so he did not show up to OTAs. He has not been at training camp. However, he was at the Bengals' first preseason game wearing Reds gear. So, yeah, he's still supporting his teammates. He's great friends with Joe Burrow. Joe has talked about that a little bit. Um, but from – what do you think about everything that's going on regarding Jesse Bates, and how did the Bengals plan – for him, if he decides to, you know, sit out a year and not risk his body in 2022. Okay, I got 13 million reasons why Jason Bates will show up the last at the last moment he should show up. Rightfully right. so, that's your right to do it. If I was his agent, I would encourage him to do that. 
um, as far as you have to understand, everyone has to sit back, chill, pump the brakes, and understand this is a business too. The Bengals on one hand, they know what they have in front of them, okay? If you put that type of money into a free safety, especially after they've drafted two safeties. That were, so we know the writing is not just on the wall. They, you know, they basically gave him his exit pass and said, okay, it's been real. You, you're a great player, but we got this guy named Mr. Burrow coming up, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chase yeah, coming up. Brett. You know, and, you know, you got so many major contracts coming up that they have to plan for the future. And, Unfortunately, you know, Jesse Bates is going to probably be more of a, I call it a cap casualty because it's more of a future thing opposed to right now. But we all know, including Zach Taylor, including Mike Brown, Katie Blackburn, so on and so forth. Everyone knows he's worth it. Everyone understands he, he's worth the dollars, the long term dollars. However, if you pay him now, what happens when, you know, Jamar Chase is up and, and Joe Burrow is up? Because, you know, Joe Burrow is pretty much, he's going to own the stadium. I mean, we, 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 he's going to get a- <laughs> He'll eventually have a statue outside of Pay Corps Stadium, right? <laughs> no, yeah. There's, I mean, you know, there's, you're going to have to go shake Mike Brown's leg and get any change you can possibly get after Joe Burrow <laughs> gets, gets his contract. So that's just, unfortunately, that's just the business side of it. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not anything- if you understand the dynamics from the business side of it, it's not anything against Jesse Bates and because Von Bell is going to be gone too. They're both going to be gone because they've reached that plateau of success that, yeah, they're going to command more money outside of the game. And another factor they're going to have, not just Jesse Bates, you're going to see it with T. Higgins. They can't afford two number ones. T. Higgins is a number one and Tyler Boyd is a 1A. So you just cannot afford them. So the Bengals have some very important decisions to make, and that's why that window of opportunity, in my very strong opinion, is only about a year max, too. When those contracts come, come due and you've had the success from a team standpoint, which means the individuals had the success, teams are going to start plucking that talent off your team. And unlike before, the Bengals, you know, we know they're not going to go out and probably compete in that market and overpay guys. It's just, you know, there's a cap dollar and then there's a green dollar. The Bengals have a lot of green dollars, but, you know, and their, their, their pockets are really tight with those green dollars, but you can't spend over the cap because that's why it's a hard cap. So it's, it's, but I like it. I like it. It's part of your success. It's part right. of the success of being a winner. And when you look at the New England Patriots and other teams, the, the LA Rams, you got to figure it out and mm -hmm. we'll, see how, we'll see how it works out for them. One second. This is saying we're running out of time. Hold on. Here we go. Okay, we've got 10 minutes left, it says. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Tim, as you were talking about uh, Jamar Chase and T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd and them being number ones, um, it really made me start to think and reminisce. It brought back memories of the of the days when AJ Green was on the team along with Marvin Jones Jr. and Muhammad Sanu. And everyone was talking about how Marvin Jones Jr. could go somewhere else and be a number one. And so could Muhammad Sanu. And you know what? When all of their contracts kind of came due around the same time, we saw the that team go their separate ways, if you will. They weren't able to pay every single number one. And they're not going to be able to do it, I don't think, again when these current contracts come due. Okay, Im imagine this, let's talk real numbers. Joe Burrow is gonna be somewhere between 250 and 300 million, okay? Yep. Whichever one you pick, you don't even have, the first guy you pick will have a hundred plus million dollar deal. So now you're at 350 to 450. The next guy will have another hundred million dollar deal. So if you pick Higgins, he's gonna have a hundred million plus. Jamar Chase is going to have another 100, year, 100 mil plus. And a Tyler Board, let's say he takes a hometown discount. What's that, 50 million? Mm -hmm. Okay, you just got $600 million wrapped in the three. Bye. I'm not even going to finish. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. This isn't basketball where you can find creative ways to get a third max contract. This is football where, remember, we're only talking about one side of the football team. 
one element. There's three more. So I guess you'll have no defense. Maybe I can come back and play. Uh, you, you'll have no defense. They might need you at that point if this happens. You're going to really be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> you have to score a lot of points. <laughs> so financially impossible. It's just impossible because I can tell you right now, when T. Higgins is up, he is going to command. He's going to be arguably the number one guy on a lot of people's list because he has it all. He has it. He has it all. And unfortunately, he was drafted in the second round, so therefore he doesn't have the longer contract a first rounder had. So that creates another problem. And in Jamar Chase's case, if you dig deep in his contract, by him making all pro two years in a row, that kicks him up when his contract is in his last year to franchise numbers. And that's one year. So, I mean, receivers would be making $20 million and, and, and you, you just, you know, you just can't do it. I, it. It's just not possible. So a great conversation to have, but pick and choose, let the debate start. It's going to be fun. We talk about it all the time on the radio. It's going to be fun to talk about who would you pick? Would you take, take Jamar Chase or would you take T Higgins? It's you can make a show every week out of it. Because right. You're not going to have both of them. So you better pick your poison. Well, that, I mean, just looking at the contracts and looking at how much money will go into keeping this team around, especially certain players like Joe Burrow, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, et cetera, um, the urgency is there. The urgency is there to continue to win, make it to the AFC championship game, and um, potentially the Super Bowl. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're counted out just because of the history of the previous teams, nine out of 10 having down years after losing in a Super Bowl. But the urgency certainly seems to feel there. I don't know if you can feel it from the fan base, um, but I can certainly feel it from the fan base. And I, I wonder if the front office feels that as well. Well, again, it, I, I, the theme of this year, I always pick a theme. And last year it was, you know, setting an expectation. And now this year is managing that expectation. Yeah. Got to go in and, and as a as a fan, because I am a fan, I have to make sure I don't put the bar so high that if they don't make it to the Super Bowl, it's a disappointment. Remember, we thought they were going to climb the ladder to maybe eight and eight or, you know, right. yeah. seven now. You know, we thought they were going to. And, OK, we would have taken a, OK, they won two more games than we thought, but they got on this roll. And now, like anything else, OK, you're not as good as you are on your best day. OK, so just manage those expectations and. The, the major problem we have is when you go to the Super Bowl, which is your, the pinnacle of success, whether you win it or not. Now, if you don't make it, you lose in the first round, you know, the first round of the playoffs or whatever. You're, you're sitting there scratching your head going, oh, well, this has been a bummer season. It's like, wait a minute. Two years ago, we would have paid, you know, left leg, <laughs> right leg, arm. You know, <laughs> we would have paid the price of a mission to get there. So. We got Even when one playoff game, we would have paid that. This is a tough year for the fan because you have to enjoy it at the same time with the understanding that, just like you said earlier in the show, that there is a strong possibility they won't make it as far as they made it last year. And, and that applies to the Rams as well. That just doesn't apply to the uh, Bengals. It applies to the Rams. So, you know, you just got to enjoy the ride. Well, Tim, McGee, I, I – Greatly appreciate you. You always exceed my expectations with every single interview that you do with your honesty and your candor and just your, your non BS way of saying things. I really enjoy it. Um, and thank you so much for being a part of the very first episode of the OT. I appreciate you so much. It's so funny. I'm sitting here, you about to bust out laughing the entire time. Because you, know, you, like my mother, like my, my wife and kids, they never know what's going to come out of this mouth. Nope, never, never. But that's one of the things I love. I, don't I, I love that. <laughs> you don't either. Yeah, no one knows. And that's the beauty of it. Who likes predictability? <laughs> but I appreciate you having me on as always. Of course. Thank you so much, Tim.
And we are just 24 days away from the season opener. The Bengals kicking things off with the Pittsburgh Steelers on September 11th. And a, a couple of notes from practice this afternoon. Jackson Carmen was not available. He was not at practice. Zach Taylor saying afterwards um, that he tested positive for COVID, so he's unavailable. But in that same position group, we have some good news because Lael Collins was back in the mix. He missed Wednesday's practice with a personal issue, but he is back. He had a hoodie on in 80 degree weather. I mean, that guy is tough as nails, in my opinion. Um, but he seems all good. That's a great sign. We've got 24 days until this show kicks off. And speaking of shows, the OT, it airs every Thursday night at 8 o'clock. Hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next week.